So, welcome to Audible. Thank you. Um, we're going to chat about your new book. Great. Oh, that's what this is about. <laughs> this is, that's what it's Sorry, about. Sorry, <laughs> I thought this was, a, uh, I'd been arrested and this was an interrogation. Well, Albeit a very stylish I was going to say, with a cosy chair. Very nice chair they have <laughs> in this police station. Um, so it's called uh, Too Much. Yes. And quite near the start, you say that you realise that maybe there's a chance that you weren't so different to everyone else. And the thought of that is terrifying. Why is the thought of that so terrifying? I think because I predicated all of my identity on being different to everybody else. As a child, I told the other children that I was an emperor. And that is difficult for a dinner lady in Zone 5 to respond to. But in the last sort of year, 18 months, I found myself doing a lot of the things that other people do. Um, moving out of their parents' home, for example, apparently something people do. Um, finding myself in a relationship um, and, um, and and also the loss of my father, I think I suddenly felt like, um, oh, like life is, life does happen, you can't sort of resist it. I think for a long time I thought by being eccentric and outside of the mainstream, I could avert any kind of um, difficulty or sadness in my life mm. um, or vulnerability. And, um, and so I've found actually um, I've started to be a bit more ordinary, and that feels quite fun. Mixing it up. Mm. 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 And would you advise anyone who's going round the house of a family where mm. a family member has recently died to bring milk? Um, that is something that I found in, in my experience was that people want a cup of tea, and that you go, would you like a cup of tea? They go, yes, which is annoying. Um, I would say take booze. Take booze. Because... Nice. Even my therapist said to me at the time, have a drink. <laughs> because I think shock is such an odd thing mm. that I think in the films and the television programs, people go around for a cup of tea and they sit with you. And mm. But in truth, to handle that shock, I, I mean, we I found brandy was very much the, um, the remedy I, I needed. Um, because people often say quite... You know, very kindly, they come around to see you and they bring things. And we had one family friend who brought around a chicken, which was very welcome, actually. It was cooked. It was not <laughs> It was not alive. That would be a strange offering. Um, so sorry for your loss. Please have this. A hen. Um, actually, that would be a great gift. Eh? Think of the eggs. And um, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the thing is, yeah, people often, of, often become quite uh, simplistic in the way they regard those times and the way that sometimes people send messages like be kind to yourself but that doesn't really mean anything I've realised that like in amongst it all where I talk about it as dead men in the book but you're suddenly caught up with phoning the coroner ordering death certificates cancelling the car insurance moving the internet account across making sure your mum's okay for money and then you've got to be kind to yourself like where's the time to do that in the <laughs> list of things phone an undertaker plan the songs you're going to do where are you going to have the wake um I've got to be kind to myself. What does that mean? Like, oh, okay, all right, I'll get a, a, a lush bath bomb, shall I? And then, okay, I'll do that. But it just becomes something else that you have to do. Yeah. And, and, and what I found is that those times are complex. And um, often it's, um, yeah, bring a pint of milk if you like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> brandy on the side. Better brandy's better. And with those two, I think you can make a brandy Alexander. Oh. Which I've never done. Maybe tonight. <laughs> And so how would you describe your dad? What what was he like? My dad was very different to me in lots of ways. He was brought up in South South East London in a place called Penge. Although if I said that, he'd go, no, I'm not from Penge, I'm from Annerley, which he thought was nicer. But to be honest, both those places sound awful. Penge, Annerley. And uh, he wouldn't say it quite as aggressively as that. But he um, he was an ordinary working class Londoner. He was a coach driver. He grew up with nothing. His dad left him and his mum when he was very, very young. And growing up, I think, in the 1940s was really difficult in a way that I think our generation would struggle to imagine. And he would try and convey that to me when I would be, like, flamboyantly wondering about, you know, what vibe we're going to create for this forthcoming Boxing Day or, you know, what what scent profile we want to have for... You know, Easter Sunday. I, I think you found that sometimes I could go over the top, and there's a phrase I use in the book, um, which he would say if I was going over the top, which is, 
There's a difference between scratching your ass and tearing the skin. And, I mean, it's not Shakespeare. <laughs> but it is, um, it, is, it is a good way to remember not to go over the top with things. Yeah. What was the best advice that he gave you? Well, again, I include it in the book, but he said, uh, always go into everything with a good heart. Because I remember being at secondary school, I just started and we were having to do maths and I wasn't very confident in maths. And I didn't, so I didn't like it. And he said, well, you've got to do it. So you can either do it kicking and screaming, but that will just waste your energy. Or you can do it with a good heart. And actually, you might find that you quite enjoy it and you might get something from it. And I did that and reframed it in that way. And actually, I did enjoy maths and I got an A. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mr. Cox. Thanks, our maths teacher. Brilliant maths teacher. So that kind of reframing, I think, is, is, was useful. My dad was 42 years older than me, so he did have a different perspective on, on life. And I, wisdom, I think, um, that I now have come to appreciate mm. and see through his eyes. I can see the world through his eyes a lot more. And you've written this book um, in the months sort of following his death. Like he, he died in December 2021, which isn't all that long ago. No. So what was it that made you want to write about and almost through that grief? I would hate for anyone to think it was a, a sort of mawkish, sad look at life. I've tried to make it as upbeat as possible because um, it is quite life affirming, actually, mm. when you realise that death is is a thing and you have to embrace life and, and also in our loss we found lots of things very funny and that need to laugh is very strong in fact the strongest time when you need to laugh is when you're at your most sad and and, and similarly we went to another funeral uh, of my dad's cousin not long after my dad's funeral and of course being the judgy little gay that I am I started comparing this funeral to my dad's and, and so we were you know there was the undertaker was wearing striped trousers and a bold purple waistcoat and combined with a walking cane and a top hat he looked like Willy Wonka like he was going to do a forward roll and invite us all into the chocolate room we went into this crematorium eventually and the first thing I saw was a sign on the wall which said what to do in the event of a fire and, and <laughs> I, I kind of thought well isn't that why we're all here um, so there are moments that when you find yourself laughing the one of the stories you recount in the book is uh, a trip to America yes where you stay with your friend Lily that's right um, and during that, you mention um, your social anxiety about not being able to pee if other people oh, yes. are listening. And the toilet doors, in, or lack of, in America. In America, it's like, well, it's, 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 it's very... It's impossible. It's, it's a very exposing <laughs> place. They have these toilet doors, which are sort of, well, they're, ba they're barely a saloon door. So you can sort of see into the cubicle. They have massive gaps around the edge. And like I say, I, I can't I can't go if I can hear voices. Never never mind if I'm like doing it on stage with people <laughs> around. I don't understand I don't it. Understand, I don't understand how any of them go to the toilet in public ever. I don't know that either. They seem to be very um very just sort of open about things, don't yeah. they? It's like they're. I, I, I mean, but then in other ways, they're very prudish. So it makes no sense to me. Yes, that's true. Why can't it? you sunbathe topless, but you can go to the toilet where you can see everything below the knee and everything above the shoulder? Yeah, what's wrong with them like that? <laughs> that is unusual, isn't it? You're right about that. <laughs> yeah, they are interesting Americans. I've always loved going to America and I like, um, I like being there and I like that um, confidence. Americans thrive on success and confidence and particularly in New York. You can't be like, oh, I'm having a bit of a bad day, actually. I think I'll just, I'll just have a duvet day, maybe watch Bake Off. Um, you have to be like, achieving, what are you done? Where are you at? Where, okay, how's your 4K, 4K, 1K, 401K? <laughs> um, that we hear about in sitcoms and things. But I was decided to embrace that positivity and confidence and found myself walking down the street and saw this woman with an amazing coat on. And I thought, I'm going to be confident and American. And so I said to her, I really love your coat. It's a great coat. And she stared at me so coldly. And I thought, well, that's a bit weird. Anyway, got to the crossing where you have to stop. And this other woman came up to me and she said, do you know who that was? And I was like, no. And she was like, that was Anna Wintour. And I was like, oh. But she didn't have her sunglasses on, so I didn't recognize her. <laughs> and no wonder she was like looking a bit bemused. I mean because she's the editor of Vogue. I don't suppose many people are like, oh, nice coat. As though, she probably thought I was making fun of her. Like, great coat, like your coat, yeah. 